Hi, I'm Bill Double, and I'm the exhibition coordinator for the Indiana University of Pennsylvania Museum. And we currently have a show that's featuring pieces from our very extensive collection. Our collection uh, currently includes more than 4,000 pieces of sculpture, painting, drawings, uh, ceramics, and we have samplings of each here in this particular show. We're going to talk about some of the individual pieces and uh, we're going to have uh, three individuals speak about art from this particular exhibit. I will be speaking Rhonda Yeager, who is our uh, conservator and curator for our museum, and Donna Cashdollar, who has been uh, someone who has been heavily involved in this museum and collection for many years. The first I want to discuss is Ben Sean, and we have uh, two pieces in this exhibit by Ben Sean, and they are part of a collection of seven pieces that were put together for the ACLU to raise funds for the Civil Rights Movement. Now Ben Sean is a social realist, and uh, he spent his time talking about the conditions of, of individuals. He uh, spent time in the South in the 60s with uh, voter registration, and he's a print maker primarily. A lot of his work is involved in, in individual rights. But he was uh, one of the leading social realists of the 20th century. The pieces we have on our collection are uh, Martin Luther King, which is done in 1968, and it was done as a cover for Time Magazine. The next artist we're going to talk about is uh, Robert Slinker. Robert Slinker spent uh, more than 30 years on the staff here at IUP in the art department, and he is a sculptor. And we have an extended amount of pieces in our collection that his he and his family donated to us. They're uh, collage pieces, 3D collage, and he, using found objects, mounted in wood boxes, and they have a very uh, similar look to Louise Nevelson. And Louise Nevelson was a New York, um, was a New York artist, sculptor. Now his pieces have all kinds of objects in them. Found objects like computer parts, um, tools, almost anything that you could pick up and find somewhere um, he, uh, he uses. And they're always crafted and assembled in beautifully finished boxes. The other artist we are gonna talk about is Frank Mason. Frank Mason um, was a New York painter, trained as a classical painter. He was really um, someone who really cared about classical work, particularly the Baroque period. Very uh, classic kind of coloring and style and design. And as a very young man, he uh, came to the Art Students League in New York and he uh, ended up being uh, a director at the Art Students League, and he was there for 50 some years. And his paintings are well known around the world. 
he has done some very uh, beautiful landscapes. He spent most of his time in New York, but he summered in Peacham, Vermont. And in about 1980, he and his wife bought a farm there. And from then on, he taught summer classes there. The piece that we have here was given to the museum by the family. And the piece that we have here is called Goodrich Silos. And it was done in Peacham, Vermont. And it, uh, as you can see, it has such a, a beautiful, soft finish and a beautiful sky. Hello, my name is Rhonda Yeager and I am on the museum board. I am the curator, um, IUP collection manager, and I also, of the collection, and I also uh, work as a teacher. I teach in the Department of Art and Design here at IUP. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a couple of pieces in this exhibit. And the two pieces that I'm going to talk about are Foggy Morning and also a piece entitled Ceramic Wear, which is by a famous Native American artist by the name of Maria Martinez. The first uh, piece that I'm going to talk to you about is by Louise Pershing. Uh, she is a very prominent Pittsburgh local artist, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, she uh, was born 1904 in Pittsburgh and she died in 1986 in Pittsburgh. She um, actually was three years at the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, uh, went to school there. She also went to school at Carnegie Institute of Technology, Carnegie Mellon University, and the University of Pittsburgh. She uh, was influenced heavily, her art was influenced by uh, abstract expressionist Hans Hoffmann, renowned uh, artist. She belonged to National Association of Women Artists, Pittsburgh Watercolor Society, Associated Artists of Pittsburgh, and actually her very first uh, very important exhibit was in 1927, and that was for the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh, which she also belonged to for uh, many years, most of her uh, adult life. She was actually um, also the first female who had her actual own gallery in uh, uh, Pittsburgh. Um, the piece that I'm talking about uh, is Foggy Morning. It is oil on campus, and it was done about 1944. Um, Foggy Morning is uh, this very beautiful piece of work. Um, she did like a brighter color palette, which you see in Foggy Morning. Uh, it's even got a little bit of a pastel -y look, but you know, these vibrant bright colors are something that she does a lot in her work, and it, and it certainly shows in this particular painting Foggy Morning. She actually, too, it was once said, uh, a director, art director, once said that her, uh, the people that she, as you can see the individuals in this particular work of art, they don't, she doesn't have her people look like actually realistic people. They're more like characters. As you can see, all the people in the painting don't really look like individuals, but they all look similar. So they're kind of characters of people. And I think, you know, this painting that she, that Foggy Morning, I think she's doing that here. She's having a lot of, you know, these generalization characters doing all these things. And it's interesting because the beach is out there, it's foggy, but they're all in here on this deck. And she often would make these kind of scenes of just people in every day-to-day -day life doing these very ordinary things, like reading the paper, uh, you know, they have a the little dog with her, uh, the one lady you can see. And they're just sitting here and um, they're, they're kind of together, but they're not together. 
So I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of contrast to different symbolism and meaning in her work. And for me, her work is always, uh, has a little surreal touch, but in a kind of very cheerful way. And like I said, I just love the colors and I love the balance in this painting. It's just really fantastic. Uh, the next piece that I want to talk to you about is one of our Native American pieces. And it's about a very famous Native American uh, ceramicist named Maria Martinez. Maria Martinez uh, is uh, uh, from New Mexico. She was born there and died in the Pueblo of San Alfonso. Uh, but she is really known for um, a particular type of ceramic ware that she and her husband Julian helped create. Um, normally when you look at Native American ceramics, um, Na Native American ceramics were done for utilitarian purposes. In other words, they were done to be used, functional objects. Uh, but uh, Maria Martinez, you know, breaks through that barrier. Um, her work starts, and what she's really known for, and what she's gave credit for is, is that she breaks this barrier. She uh, actually, uh, you know, has her work come to importance uh, of reframing Native American ceramics to a fine art, not just a utilitarian object, but something that is, you know, a fine art, beautiful, and something that you display uh, and look at and consider a fine art. Uh, and not just a utilitarian object. So uh, she's, you know, very well known for that. Um, she was, you know, she started ceramics at a very young age. This ceramics were very much a community project, uh, traditionally uh, in Native American cultures. Um, everyone made a different, you know, a different part of the making of the piece. Um, she, uh, she and her husband, Julian, uh, which, uh, who, you know, accompanied her on a lot of her artistic adventures, uh, ended up um, creating their black on black where uh, part of this happened because they ended up, there was a archeological uh, dig um, research project that was going on not too far from uh, the uh, San El Alfonso, and they became uh, involved in this uh, archeology span project and uh, they found shards of this pottery, and they studied it, and they made drawings of it, uh, uh, Maria Martinez and her husband, Julian. And what they found were these pieces that had very, uh, designs they had, you know, not seen before. Uh, they also, you know, very uh, distinctive geometric patterns, and they also found this black pottery. And so they experimented with a lot of firing techniques, uh, they experimented with a lot of different clays, and finally, uh, they found that using powdered manure would uh, actually, uh, you know, remove some of the oxygen during the firing process, and but it still retained the heat. And the pottery that came out of it had this, you know, it was blackened. So this is the beginning of this black on black. They kind of reinvent this from pottery they see in this ancient Native American, uh, ex, you know, dig excavation site. So uh, what they did was the uh, black pottery would have a very shiny surface to it, and then they would make a, a mat uh, by using guaco, which is a plant substance, uh, on the black polished uh, pottery. And this substance, they would do the mat. It wouldn't be shiny, it would be matte. It would consist of different designs, such as um, these symbols that they saw at the dig, and they draw. They did these renderings of drawings and sketches. They would be uh, things, natural phenomena, like uh, clouds, um, you know, geometric designs, birds, all these different symbols in Native American culture. But as I said, um, you know, she uh, was very, very important uh, to having this recognition of Native American ceramics, creating it as a fine art, and also of Native American culture in general.
I'm Donna Cashdollar. I retired from the museum board a few years ago, and uh, my specialty kind of in this uh, exhibition anyway is Milton Bancroft, because one of the last uh, exhibitions that I organized for the museum was a retrospective of Milton Bancroft's work in the museum collection. We probably have the biggest group of his work from the beginning of his career to the end of it of any institution in the United States. So I'm, I'm going to walk, we have seven of the pieces here in this exhibition, and I'm going to talk about five of them that kind of trace his career from the very beginning to the very end. And the first painting I'm going to talk about in this exhibition, uh, we don't know the title of it. We acquired it just a few years ago and had it recently restored and cleaned. I, I call it the French laundresses. What it is, um, if you look at it close up, you can see a pipe that has diverted water from a nearby stream into a cistern um, near a pavilion that has been paved in so that women can gather there conveniently to do their laundry and probably socialize at the same time, give them a little time away from family demands where they can talk among themselves. Uh, it's, it's a reasonably dark painting, even now it has been cleaned, it's still dark. And that reflects his interest in the Barbizon School of France at that time. Painters like Millet, who painted the Angelus and the Gleaners, uh, they, they like to paint scenes of everyday French workers' lives, and this is representative of that very early in his career. And he may have exhibited it at one of the salons in Paris because he did exhibit there, but we do not have that information. Next we'll go to Mater Amor, and it's also known as the Angel of the Lilies. And this was um, done in 1907, and we know that he exhibited it in at least three places, Chicago, um, Philadelphia, and New York City. And in New York City, it was at the National Academy of Design, where he was exhibiting right beside artists like uh, Daniel Chester French, and Cecilia Beau, and Robert Henry, among many other famous names that you would recognize. And this is from a period in which allegorical figures were very popular. The, those are mostly female figures, very stylized, that were to represent the arts and sciences, and also ideals like um, motherhood and uh, religious faith and pat patriotism. And um, this, this is a very beloved painting here at IUP. It's been reproduced on Christmas cards and, and uh, in various places. But I want to also point out the frame. This is the original frame in which he exhibited this painting. And we have some letters in special collections at IUP here. Um, Bancroft's letters back to his wife. And also some of his business correspondence. And among that is a series of letters to a businessman who wanted to buy the painting, but he really wanted to buy that frame with it. And Milton Bancroft had spent a lot of money on that frame and did not want to part with it. He intended to use it in future exhibitions. So there is a little back and forth. And finally, the man decided, well, if you won't sell me the frame, I don't want the painting. And that was a disappointment to Bancroft, but we're very happy that that happened because we love it here. Um, next we move on to, he would had a very successful career with the allegorical paintings and actually um, painted uh, ten murals for a, a pavilion in the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco in 1915. And it was a coup to be selected to paint for that project. And he came back to New York City and things were already changing. The, Armory Show had, had brought modern art, modern art to New York City and um, artists were doing very different things. But also, America was getting ready to enter World War I and there was a lot of, um, a lot going on as the country prepared to do that. And uh, among the things that Bancroft did then when he got back from San Francisco was design posters, as many American artists did, uh, promoting the war effort in some way from the home front. His son, who was old enough at, to enlist at that point, did enlist in 1917 and was sent overseas and Milton wanted in the worst way to do something to volunteer overseas, not just at home. Um, he was too old to do most of the kinds of things that would have put him in the, uh, in the battlefields, you know, where troops were fighting. 
and he was uh, sent by the YMCA, hired by the YMCA, to design rest and recreation stories for America, uh, stations for American troops where they could stay while they were waiting to be transported back home. And he also saw um, a lot of devastation. I mean, he was there at the end of the war and he saw no fighting, but he saw what fighting can do and what it does not only to the countryside, but to the people. And one of the drawings that is here is of a despondent soldier and it's not sure, we're not sure what nationality he is. But he's holding a gun, so he's probably not a German. Could be a French soldier, could be an American soldier, seated at the entrance to a bunker, and it was a German bunker, beside the entrance to the German trenches. Uh, the trenches, you can see when you look closely, are reinforced by a wicker work um, trellis kind of arrangement to keep the mud from sliding in on you too, too badly. Um, but it is among many drawings that we have here in the collection that show just what war does to a country. Um, anyway, a, a very moving experience to him, obviously, but this is one of the drawings that he did from that period. And he brought about 200 of them back and exhibited some at the Corcoran Museum of Art in Washington, D.C. in, I believe it was 1920. And a few of the ones that were in that exhibit we actually have in the IUP Museum's exhibition here, or collection here. This one is called Ramps. It's about the, the city of Ramps and the right still lives. And he's, he's, it's trying to show that um, despite all the destruction of war, that there's a spirit of patriotism and a spirit of rebuilding. And that's what the poster is trying to show. And it's really interesting because it's original, you can see um, the conservation, uh, conservationists wanted to preserve the fact that you could see how he worked. You can see the holes in the corners of the paper where he tacked it to his easel. Um, you can see you know, that this went through the difficulties of, of transporting art during that time. The, the edges are a little shabby, but it, it is conserved and um, pre preserved so that it's going to last a long time from now. The last painting that we're going to talk about in this exhibition, I think when he got back from France, he was so happy, he actually retired. He closed his studio in New York City. He retired being a, shall we say, a professional artist. Um, went back to Sandy Spring, Maryland, where his wife had been living with his family all the years that he spent in New York City. And uh, obviously, he, he visited from time to time, but, um, his last paintings are many landscapes, and they are a very different style from what we've seen earlier. He transitioned to kind of an impressionistic style where the colors are lighter, the strokes are freer, and uh, they're just a happier looking kind of painting than, than we have seen him do before, especially during World War I. Um, this, the landscape that's here in the exhibition is dated 1925, and it really gives you the impression that he was so happy to be back in a beautiful landscape that wasn't disturbed by war that uh, he was going to make the most of it. <laughs>